we, we do try to record to the cloud and then post it or, you know, IT post it. I guess I'll start my, my video as well. Um, all right, and we have five attendees right now. I think, oh, Sid, let's see. Oh, Sid said he's getting an error message on the Zoom link. Hmm. Maybe. There were two links. Ooh. <clears throat> Different numbers. Uh, yeah, I got a message saying I needed to put in the meeting ID. Oh, interesting. So let me um, let me just try. It. I'll send this. So why is that? Let me go to my Zoom account and see. Yeah. Everyone else was able to join, though, right? But was it a pro was there a problem joining? Mine was easy. I, I had to put in the meeting ID, which I wasn't expecting, but I went back and grabbed it and put it in. So it wasn't that big a deal. Yeah, it, yeah. it said no password. So maybe it's just, let me send Sid the webinar. Oh, you know what? That is interesting. It does look like- um, Like he's in the attendees room. Oh, is he now? I was gonna say, actually, I'm just looking at my the webinar link and online. It looks different than what was in the, um, what was on the agenda. Oh, All right, here, Sid. Oh, yeah, here's Sid. All right, Sid, we're making you a panelist. I think I, think I hit Sid. All right, we have Sid. Are you there? An error. Hey, Sid. Great. Hey, Sid. All right, so we have everyone. Sorry, Sid, I saw your email. I was, it just, was just about to send you something. Yeah, no, I was able to get in. Okay. Um, I think there's like two links, one on the top of, I use, I use the one that you send an email, but then I use the one on, on the, uh, what's the name of it, on the agenda. Yep. I couldn't get the one on the email. The agenda one worked. Yeah, it's sometimes, I think as a panelist, sometimes one works, the other one you might have to go through the whole, um, enter the webinar oh, okay. ID, but it should bring you to the same place. So I can, um, I was gonna, we have a quorum, we have, um, I'm going to turn that off. There's minutes. Here's the agenda, if everyone can see that. Um, make it a little bigger. I got it on my computer. All right, I think we're good with the... Uh... All right, John, I think if we... I think we're all set to start. Okay, great. I see Erica. I didn't see her before, so that's good. Mm -hmm. hey, um, can I just ask a question of, of process? Mm -hmm. um, if there are other people participating, you know, viewing this, you know who they are, right, Nate? Is that true? I, I do. So right now there's there's ten attendees. Uh, oops, uh, ten attendees in addition to the members of the trust. Okay. And is there any way to find out who they are, just in case it's Makes a difference. Sure. It looks like um, I, you know, there's uh, Laura Baker. Uh, members from Valley CDC are here to present. Um, looks like if you uh, go on the participants list, you should be able to see him because I can see him on. Oh, the I can look at list. the participants list. Uh, yeah, yeah down at the bottom. Yes, panelists. Yeah. You could, right. It says attendees. Yep. Got it. The attendees. Yeah. Yeah. So there's you know, some members. There's uh, neighbors from 132 Northampton Road. There's some members of the planning board. Yep. And just members of the public. Got it. Thank you. All right. And then um, for everyone listening, we uh, just let everyone in the public know, we schedule these as webinars. So the uh, Housing Trust and myself are panelists and then everyone else is an attendee. And so we'd ask that you, uh, if you hover over your name, I think you can right click or click on the um, a drop down arrow and you can raise your hand if you'd like to speak. And then John, John or I can recognize you. Um, so you should be able to see everything and hear everything, even if you can't see, um, see, you know, see each other. And John, I'll make you a co-host. And if somebody, if one of the, you're saying if one of the attendees wants to make a, a statement or, or raise a hand, they can do that too, right, Nate? Right, they would hover over, like the, over their name and then you can hit, I think it's more, 
or something, they can they can raise their hand. There's a little raise the hand button. Okay. And that's how they would signify that. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. No, that's fine. Okay, so we're ready to get started. Um, I don't have any announcements. Does anybody else have an announcement? Uh, no. No? Okay, most of the things that would be announcements are already part of the agenda. Right, and it's, yeah. a, it's a pretty detailed agenda, so we need to do our best to get through it. Uh, the first thing are minutes from May 21st. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I sent those out a couple of times. And uh, yeah, just so, pulling them up too if people want to see them. Yeah, it's more more than you can read at this time, but you know, here are some minutes. If it's proof that we actually do have minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, if there aren't any comments, then I'm going to rule that the minutes are accepted as they were distributed. Mm -hmm. And um, the link, just to let people oh, know. Yeah. Uh, that you know, uh, sorry, John. They the once it's the you know once we record it, um, the town's IT department puts it on the um, the town's YouTube channel. So sometimes it takes um, you know a week to ten days, and then I don't I, I don't get notified when that happens. So I can um, I, I just have to look online and try to find it. But we can get that link there. I'll double check if it's yeah. up yet. I, it just hadn't been up yet when I made the notes. Yeah, no, I, I looked um, the other day too and I didn't see it. And then, um, but I know they've been doing stuff because I get notices in my Zoom account saying things are being tinkered with. <laughs> so I know, I know someone's going in there and moving stuff around. I just don't know when it gets posted. So. I don't know if anyone had any comments on the minutes or. Yeah, I did make a few minor changes. Um, but basically, it seemed to me that they were in good order. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll move on to our first agenda item, which is probably the longest agenda item, a discussion of 132 Northampton Road. Um, this is an opportunity for Laura Baker and possibly others from Valley Community Development to do a presentation on the permit that they've requested from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, following their presentation, I'll give people an opportunity to comment. Um, but also, uh, following that, I want to talk about our sending a letter of support uh, from the Housing Trust to the Zoning Board of Appeals. But so that's that's really what's involved in item number three. So it's a lengthy item. Um, I think we may as well just move on to uh, Laura's presentation. Laura, you um, uh, you have um, two. I promoted both. You know, you were on twice in Zoom. I don't know if one's audio and one's video or not, but hmm. um, I don't know either. <laughs> all right. And then, do you know? Um, it's like someone else has raised their hand. Do you know? Is anyone else joining you, Laura? Um, it may be that there's another staff member from Valley, one or two others who are joining, Jane oh, yeah, Whistler sorry. and Joanne Campbell. Okay, so I'm promoting Jane to um, a panelist now. So some folks may know Joanne Campbell has been with Valley for almost 20 years, is retiring at the end of this month. Um, and we've hired a new executive director, Jane Leckler, and she began on June 1st. So she's kind of uh, double teaming with Joanne for this month, and then we'll do a transition. And she's got a strong affordable housing background, so we're, we're happy to have her. And I think, Jane, you can unmute yourself and start your video if you'd like. You're, um, you're, you should be a panelist. It's fine. I don't know. Okay. Let's see. okay. There I am. <laughs> Yeah, this is Jane, um, I'm, and um, I was trying to figure out how I could uh, chat or say something there. So, um, yeah, this is Jane Leckler, and I'm glad to be uh, here tonight to meet you all, and we'll be um, uh, getting up to speed on the Amherst project. So, just wanted to come along. Great. And Laura, do you have, do you see a new share on the top of your Zoom screen? Do you have something that says a share, new share? If you want to go I have a share. I have a green share screen button arrow. 
Sure, you click on that, and then if you have a, if you already have the document open, you can. You have to unshare it. yours first, I think, Nate. Yeah, uh, she can. She should be able to share right over me. I'll stop sharing and then see if okay. Laura can. Uh... Well, I I was unsuccessful trying to do that on my meetings. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to learn from you, Nate. All right. So, do you folks see like a opening page here? No. Yes. <laughs> Some do and some don't. You should. I still see the the minutes. Really? No. For studio apartments. Maybe. Yeah. I see it. Yep. Tom, do you have the minutes open on your desktop uh, independently of the Zoom meeting? That might be. Erica, oh, Will, yeah. can you see? Okay, see, no, those I, see the screen? I can see it. Okay. Yeah, I see it now. I got it. Cool. So, um, Basically, there are three sections to this, and I'll try to go through it pretty quickly because you guys are pretty familiar with the project already. Um, the first uh, is kind of the, the program that mm -hmm. we're presenting in our comprehensive permit. The second is a comparable that John thought might be interesting for the group because we have a similar project that's just uh, wrapping construction in Northampton. And then the third is I brought a select excerpt of plans for the proposed building at 132 Northampton Road. Um, hopefully folks know that the full zoning application is available on the town's website um, through the planning and zoning department. So you can see everything, all the text, all the sections, all the attachments and all the plans. So it's pretty voluminous. So I tried to just shrink it down for the purposes of, of this evening. Um, the site location most folks are familiar with is highlighted here in light green. Uh, it's about halfway up Northampton Road. It is uh, directly adjacent to the field house and the athletic field. Uh, it's four tenths of a mile from the town center and the nearest bus stop. It's six tenths of a mile downhill to the shopping center. It's on a major road. It's a 0.88 acre lot. Uh, and there's a mixed use uh, set of abutters, including single and multifamily residential and institutional uses. Uh, the proposed development is, as we have talked about it prior, 28 uh, small studio apartments designed for single adults. Each apartment has a bathroom and a kitchenette. There are common areas incorporated into the building and two offices, one for property management and one for an on-site resident services coordinator. Um, this table is just a little uh, snapshot of the building, it's two and a half stories, 28 units, two handicapped accessible units. The average unit size is 235 gross square feet and the accessible ones are almost 400 gross square feet. And the total building square footage is coming in just under 12,000 square feet. Um, I can share this, uh, this slideshow after because um, it's a little bit dense, some of these pages. Um, again, this is kind of reviewing things that you probably heard before. Uh, we're proposing 10 units um, that would have a homeless preference and serve people who are at 30% AMI or less with a project-based subsidy. Another two that would serve clients of the Department of Mental Health, again, with a project-based subsidy. Eight that would serve low-income folks earning below 50% of the area median income, and that would be a self-pay unit. Proposed rent, and this may shift a little bit, is $740, including all utilities. Um, eight studio units at 80% AMI for moderate income individuals, a proposed rent of $795, no, no subsidy. Um, I updated the income limits. They just changed recently in April. So you'll see here a single person household for 30% AMI, 50%, and 80%. If that person paid 32% of their gross income for their rent and utilities, this is how much they could afford to pay. Um, and so we kind of look at what's the range of affordability with these different um, tiers of units. Uh, the development can house, but it's not excluded to uh, chronically homeless persons. And this is just is an illustration of kind of the breadth of the definition of, of homelessness. It's people who don't have fixed uh, residence, people who are at threat of losing their housing, people who have, are experiencing domestic violence, people who are paying more than 30% of their median income for rent. So there's a whole bunch of categories and types of people that fall into this that may be a broader range of folks than we normally think of when we think of people who are homeless. 
Um, we have a, a draft supportive services plan that was um, submitted with the project eligibility letter. Uh, the full plan, it's kind of lengthy, is also available through the town's website. So I'm just going to hit the high points. Uh, we increased the number of on-site uh, resident service coordinator hours. Um, originally, we had proposed, I think, 20 hours, somewhere in that range. And so we've bumped it up to 27 half to 30 hours per week. Uh, we have a property management presence on site. We think about 20 hours a week. We have MOUs with various other community agencies who would deliver um, services to individuals. Uh, Department of Mental Health would provide kind of wraparound services for its um, clientele. And then homeless tenants would enter the property uh, with a service provider sponsor who would support them for their initial period of occupancy. And then if they were going to phase back, step away from that tenant, they would link that tenant with community-based services. Um, the ZBA hearings, just so that you folks know when they're coming up, the opening hearing date is Thursday, June 25th at six o'clock. It will also be in the Zoom format. Um, and then there's a second hearing date that's been scheduled for July 2nd, which is only one week later. So there's an assumption that we won't get it all done in one night, um, and then it would be continued at least to a second night, and my guess is beyond that as well. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, information about a project in Northampton at 82 Bridge Road um, called Sergeant House. Uh, it's also located on Route 9, walking distance to downtown. It's on a parcel that's significantly smaller. It's less than half an acre. Uh, it's a historic house built in 1820 that has been renovated and restored and a large new addition has been added. It's a conversion from 15 uh, bedroom lodging house to a 31 unit studio of studio apartments. Uh, it has less on-site parking than we're proposing for the site in Amherst. It has 14 parking spaces. Uh, the apartments are similar in size and scale to the Amherst studio apartments uh, development. It will also house homeless, some homeless persons, uh, some referrals from DMH and other low income individuals. Uh, it has significantly less on-site staffing, um, two days a week of property management and about 15 hours a week of resident services coordinator. Um, we held a lottery for tenants who were interested in moving to this property in January of 2020. We had 250 qualified applicants who went into the lottery pool of whom 152 reported that they were homeless. So I just throw out those numbers to emphasize that there's a considerable uh, backlog of demand for this type of housing. So we're due to complete construction this month and we'll begin le leasing up to tenants at the end of this month and probably through August. Um, the tenant profile at that property, uh, it's more slanted toward the very low income tenants. So more units are at this 30% AMI level, um, more units with 18 units that have project-based vouchers. And we don't have any 80% AMI units. The, the highest income tier at this property is 60% AMI. So it's less of a mixed income property than the one that's being proposed um, in Amherst. I brought some photos. If you've driven Route 9, you might've noticed the property. Um, it is an old building, and when it work started, it kind of went down to the studs. <laughs> it looked like this shell of a building, uh, and now it's kind of being rebuilt and recreated, and, and, and a lot of really nice restoration work is happening there. So this is the, the street-facing side. Um, this is the driveway, and, and you'll see that the, the historic facade and front part of the house is, is very traditional, and then it kind of transitions to a more modern look uh, in the back. So if you're standing in the backyard, this is what the property looks like. And the interior of these units, and again, these are of a comparable size to the ones that are being proposed um, in Amherst. Just to give you kind of a, a little bit of a feel, it's hard to tell scale from photos, um, but especially I wanted to show a typical kitchenette because people aren't sure what that is and what that might include. Um, so this is pretty standard. It's a 24 inch oven and range. It's a built in microwave with a vent hood. Um, it's a sink uh, and it's a full size refrigerator, you know, a little bit of counter space and some cabinets. So it's basic, it's small, but it's also we think it's it's pretty functional. Um, and then each of these uh, rooms also has its own bathroom. So moving now, I might try to minimize these a little bit, too small, um, to the Amherst Studio Apartments development. 
Uh, these are renderings that there, our architect put together kind of showing more of a 3D image of what this property might look like. Uh, this is the facade that would be facing Northampton Road. Um, this is the facade that would be facing the Conway Fieldhouse. Uh, this is the rear of the property that would be facing the athletic track. And this is the side that would be facing the driveway. Um, we have advanced the site plan, so there are some changes here. Um, people may recall originally we were trying to reuse the existing house, and so we were kind of way back right at the rear lot line. This proposal that we're presenting now is includes demolition of the existing house and then creating a, a larger buffer between the building and uh, Pratt Field. That's about 30 to 35 feet of area here. It allows for some additional um, screening and vegetation in here. Uh, the parking lot has been relocated slightly. So uh, right now it comes right at the property line, which is about here. So it's pulled back about 14 feet from this um, abutting property. Uh, it's a two-way driveway. Uh, we've increased the number of parking spaces. We started out at 14 and now we have 16 spaces. Um, includes a turnaround for uh, a dumpster truck or emergency vehicles, um, an enclosure here with dumpsters and a shed here for you know, gardening or other kinds of supplies. We have a covered bike rack that's here. Um, and let me put you up a little more. Um, an outdoor patio here. Some mechanical systems are shown on pads outside the building. Some potential gardening areas are shown. Uh, and a designated smoking area is identified here, which would have a bench um, and a, a kind of covered pavilion over it, small one. Um, the only place that smoking would be allowed on the property. Certainly no smoking would be allowed in the building. Um, so essentially we have walkways that meet accessibility code that connect the main entry uh, to the parking area. They connect the main entry out to the sidewalk here on Northampton Road. And then some smaller, again, fully accessible pathways that travel around the building. Um, some of these faint lines you're seeing here have to do with the stormwater management system. We're retaining all of the runoff and stormwater is being filtered and retained on the site itself. This is the elevation of the building that is facing the driveway. So it's a split level, which means you come in on grade into a lobby area, and I'll show you the floor plans. And then you're either gonna head down stairs or down the elevator to the ground floor, which is partially below grade. Uh, on this side, it's more below grade. On the side that faces uh, Conway Fieldhouse, it's mostly pretty fully exposed. Um, or you head upstairs or up the elevator to the first floor or to the second floor of the building. Again, this is the front elevation that would be kind of facing toward Northampton Road. This is that more fully exposed elevation that would be facing toward the Conway Fieldhouse. Uh, we're proposing kind of a stone clad uh, finish for this ground floor level and then more traditional clabbered style finish for the upper floors. And then this would be the facade that's facing um, the track. So overall in its appearance, we're trying to have something that's pretty traditional, but looks very residential. Uh, we looked a lot at the residence halls that are on the Smith campus and the Amherst campus for kind of some inspiration for this design. Um, the, this is the, the ground floor plan. So again, you're entering here into a lobby area. It's connected to the property management office with a, there'll be a viewing window here. Um, again, you can go up or down stairs or you can hop on the elevator to go up or down probably have mailboxes and things right in this area. On the ground floor, in the section of the building that tends to be the most below grade, um, we have things like a mechanical room, a laundry room, stairwell egress, um, and then you're seeing units. All these ones labeled with a number are, are individual units. Um, there are stair towers on either end for egress as well as in the middle of the building. 
Uh, and then most of the common areas are here. The common room um, is a good sized space. It, it's shown with some furnishings, but it's pretty open to what, what could be there. It could have some dining areas, lounging areas. It opens out directly onto the patio. Um, right next door to that is the resident services coordinator's office. Um, and we have a public restroom or a restroom for guests um, that's fully handicapped accessible as well. Um, the first floor um, has an office for the property management team. Um, and the rest of the first floor are all residential units. Um, this on the corner is the handicapped accessible unit. You'll see it's quite a bit larger to accommodate a wheelchair. Um, it stacks on top of that common room that we saw below. And then you see units, and if, it's a little faint, but you can see beds and furnishings um, in these units, just so you can kind of get a sense of how a person might live in a space that's this small. Um, and then the second floor is pretty much a duplication of the first floor without the office. Uh, we have another accessible unit here, um, and again, more residential units. And then this is kind of a, a close up of a couple of samples of the residential units, one accessible unit and two different kind of configurations of more typical non accessible units. And that is the end. Okay, great. Thanks, Laura. You're welcome. Let's open it up for uh, questions first. Questions from members of the trust. Well, I was going to say just quickly, this is Nate as a staff member. The, um, I just want to say that, you know, the Valley CDC, um, you know, they own the property and they've submitted a comprehensive permit. So it's a 40B comprehensive permit application, which means that all the local permitting is done under this comprehensive permit. So, uh, you know, if they need permits from the historical commission to demolish the building, if they need permits from public works or other things, it's all under this one permit. So, um, that's, you know, that's the idea of a comprehensive permit. It, it also allows an applicant to waive different zoning requirements. So, you know, they, uh, online, you can see there's a number of, of waiver requests, none are too substantial. Um, but, you know, so what they're, you know, what, what 40B allows an applicant to do is if they need um, a little bit taller building or closer to the side setback or something, they can waive certain zoning requirements. And that's part of the ZBA review. So the ZBA is reviewing this as they would a normal project, but then there's every um, waivers from review from other boards and committees all packaged into this one application. So it's really meant to be, you know, kind of a one, one stop uh, application process. So, you know, this is, this is the trust chance to review it. It's been formally submitted. And then like um, Laura said, the hearing starts at the, at the end of the month. And so, you know, sometimes other projects may come to the trust or other boards and committees for comments at different parts in the process, but this was transmitted to all boards and committees now. And so this is really the chance for all boards and committees in town to provide comment. So, you know, it went to the Disability Access Advisory Committee, the Planning Board will look at it, Town Council may look at it, Historical Commission, Design Review Board, who, you know, there's a number that may be interested. And so it's all happening together uh, for this one application process. Just so that's just kind of a quick snapshot of how that works. I'll just start off by saying it is a beautiful project, Laura. I mean, thank it's, you. It's really beautiful. And thank uh, you. Hard to find any faults in it at all. Um, I might be a little worried about the rents for the 50% group. Seems like you've got a pretty tight um, range there. Yep. Are you expecting a lot of mobile vouchers in for that group? You know, honestly, we, we're not sure. We, the, the, the people who live around this property had a concern that if those rents were low, um, we would not get the kind of mixed income profile that we really want in the property. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of why those rents were tweaked upward um, to try to attract, you know, just a range of people. Yeah, yeah. So there's some room if you had to reduce the rent, if you couldn't quite get the full occupancy that you need. Yeah, I mean, as you know, the, the, the caps 
the AMI caps are ceilings. Yep. Um, but this was one way we thought we could encourage, again, to just have a greater economic diversity in the property. You know, I was just comparing the rents for the 50% group in Northampton with the rents for the 50% group in Amherst and there's... Yeah, it was an intentional choice and it was responding to that comment about, you know, if the rents are all very low and people can use mobile vouchers, do you end up with all yeah. very low income folks when you hadn't really had that as your vision? Well, I won't share my personal uh, feelings about that. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, there's, you know, every, there's, there's gray everywhere, so. Okay. Beautiful project. Absolutely. Thank good. you. I may steal some of your ideas. <laughs> Go for it. The more the merrier. Believe me, there'll be long, long waiting lists, so plenty of tenants for everybody. Other comments or questions from yeah, Justin? Okay. I, I uh, agree. It looks it looks like a really nice project. I, I'm excited about it. Thank you. Um, I, you may have covered this, uh, but I just just for clarification, these are all um, single person occupancy. What what happens if uh, someone becomes a couple? Right. Do they have to move out or something? Yeah, I mean, we have talked a lot with the community about overnight guest policies, and we have, we've actually changed our overnight guest policy in response to community comments. But yeah, they're not intended for two people to be living in together. So we have seen situations where people have become a couple within a building and kept two different rooms. Um, certainly, we've seen situations where people have moved out into different housing if they partner up. Um, We've had situations where someone is um, pregnant or reunifying with children and we work with them to find a larger place that's um, better for a family maybe. So yeah, there's, there's different scenarios that take place. Um, there are um, state sanitary code regulations about how much square footage you need per person. And most of these units, not all of them, fall into that one person category. Um, the accessible units are larger, so there is a potential that we could have two people who moved into one of the accessible units if they chose. We haven't seen that happen. I mean, we, we've owned um, this type of housing for a long time, and it, it works really well for one person, and there are a lot of one-person households out there who don't want to share, you know, the way that students share a bedroom and, you know, share kitchens and bathrooms. So they kind of seem to naturally gravitate to this, this type of housing. And I, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, is this, is this um, house gonna have a name like the Sergeant House? Is it gonna have a name at some point? I sure hope so. <laughs> I have a list, you wanna help me? It's funny, it's one of the hardest things to get a good name. So we will um, welcome input from the trust on having a name because it's nicer to have a name. Um, and so we'll, we'll be searching for that, that name for it instead of calling it Amherst Studio Apartments, but that's our placeholder for now. Oh, I like that name. <laughs> Amherst Studio Apartments. <laughs> I think it's, so I think it's <laughs> Tara? Wondering, you showed Carol, can you I, speak? Can you speak into the mic? I if I mic. knew where it was, I would. Um, <laughs> is this any better? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's okay. Good. Okay. Uh, if I mean, you showed how there's some little amount of cupboards for the kitchen. I just don't see any kind of like storage, closety sorts of space. Is that what about that? Yeah. So the floor plans will. Um, have closets. So this is a closet here as an example in this particular one. Um, but that's, and here's a closet over here. So it's, we usually try to get a like a double wide closet, but there's no question that storage is limited. Um, you have to be very selective about what you bring. Um, it's, it's small, you know, you really have to be thoughtful about it. So Where does furniture come from, Laura, for the individual apartments? Yeah, so we don't, we don't typically furnish apartments. People bring their own furniture, which most people have. Um, 
For folks who don't have furniture, there's a number of organizations, social service providers that work to help people who are transitioning from homelessness into permanent housing to get the basics, you know, a bed, a table, a dresser. I mean, honestly, these units don't accommodate a lot of furniture, so people really just need the basics. We don't find that getting furniture is an obstacle for, for people. It's really getting the unit that's the big challenge. <clears throat> Can I ask, um, you said that there are so many people who need this type of housing. How do you determine who's going to actually get it? Sure. So some of it is eligibility. So that's kind of a screen that we do. So you saw the different income limits, right. those are the eligibility criteria. We have 10 units with a homeless preference. And so we'd be looking at those different characteristics. Um, we have two units that would be referrals of clients from DMH and who then we would screen once they were referred. And then there's a lottery. So there's a marketing period that's usually several months um, and there's a deadline and then there's a public lottery where all the numbers go into a bin, you know, fishbowl, bingo ball thing and get pulled out. And that becomes the wait, the, the, the order in which people are offered units. It also becomes the initial wait list uh, for the property. Thank you. Sure. Laura, this is Nate. Just a quick yeah. question back to Carol's um, a question about the storage. You don't have any outside or um, other storage in the basement or lower levels. It's just what's in the unit. We don't have a basement. <laughs> right. So, yeah. right. It's people are limited to what is in their, their own unit. Um, the only real outdoor storage space is there is a bike, a, a place for people to store bicycles um, outside that's covered. And people manage with that in your Northampton properties. Yep. I mean, if the price is right, it people work pretty nicely within these spaces and even much smaller spaces. So we have properties. I mean, the Sargent House had rooms that were, you know, 100 square feet that people lived in. And then they shared 15 people shared four bathrooms and one kitchen. Um, and we've owned that building, it's been fully occupied for 30 years. So for someone who's coming from that situation, this is a big, this is a big upgrade because at least you're not forced to share facilities with other people. And for some folks, that's, you know, they may have social challenges already. So putting them in a forced shared situation just isn't, isn't great. How green will the building be? <laughs> Super green. We can paint it green now. <laughs> so um, we are looking, we are hoping, it would be our first, um, to have this building be Passive House certified. So Passive House is one of those kind of categories on the leading edge of energy efficiency. Um, it's a pretty rigorous standard. Um, so they really look at how much energy use you have per person, and you have to kind of get it, whittle it down to a certain point. What that will mean in practical building terms is probably double thick walls, um, probably triple glazed windows, uh, high efficiency heating and air exchange system. Um, and we're also going to incorporate, hopefully, we budget for it, uh, PV panels on the roofs that will accept those. You know, honestly, the design doesn't lend itself super well to PV panels. There's a little bit of a tension between maximizing solar for the roof and having this nice kind of you know traditional slash victorian style roof line but it will be very very energy <coughs> and we also think we'll be able to use all electric utilities so we've been trying to get away from fossil fuels um, and we think this will again be our first property that doesn't use any fossil fuels so that means electric heat uh, hot water, set air conditioning, so. Laura, would the windows be um, operational or are they, all, are they fixed windows or do some uh, open? Yeah, in the units, the windows would be operable. Um, often in the, con like the lobby or the common area, they might be fixed. Um, and typically they have restrictions so you can only open them so far because it's a fall hazard. But yeah, you can open them. Okay. But each unit will have its own thermostat so that you should be able to control, you know, there'll be a ceiling and a floor, but you can control the heat and um, air conditioning in your own unit, which again is not 
true for all lodging house style buildings or places that people live. And uh, it's a big benefit to be able to, to set your own temperature. Yeah. Laura, this, this is it. Congratulations. Let me add on to that. Beautiful, beautiful project. Thank you. Um, is, is there a space for anything that deals with fitness and, and healthy living uh, yeah. inside or outside? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we'll have to really look at how we set up that common room because that it's a, it's a good sized room. It certainly could accommodate some kind of fitness activity. And, um, you know, we could do some modular furnishings and things that we could, it, it's going to have to be a highly adaptive space. Correct. Um, and then, you know, this is a pretty walkable location. So uh, we assume a lot of people won't have cars. They'll be walking. Um, it's very close to the bike trail. Um, it's close to some of the electric bike rental stands. So we hope that people will get some activity just in their daily life as well. Have you had any contact with the college about use of their facilities? I have not, but that's a great idea. You mean, do you mean the field or you mean their gyms, like well, indoor stuff? I guess you could take it as far as you want, but I was assuming that, you know, the, the, the community already has access to the yeah. field. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they've, they understand that, um, and we understand that the general public is um, able to use the track, which is directly behind this um, property um, for walking or running, um, and that any, any individual who created a nuisance on that site would be trespassed. Um, so we've kind of covered that quite a bit with them. Uh, we haven't asked about use of indoor gym, gym facilities, but it would be an interesting conversation to have with them. They've, they've been very supportive, so they might be open to that. With the Y in Springfield, we subsidized some of our residents to use it, so. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's great. Okay, any other trust members? Uh, Will has his hand up. He's giving me a high five. High five, Will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Laura, do you, um, do you anticipate parking being an issue? I'm just thinking 16 spaces for 28 units. Um, like, is there any nearby offsite parking? It's kind of fun. Right. So parking is always a, a hot topic um, in affordable housing in general. So we, our goal when we started planning this was to have between 0.25 and 0.5 parking spaces, which is between seven and 14 parking spaces. And that's based on our experience at other properties with low income tenants and how many actually have cars. Um, so we stretched a little bit, we're up to 16 parking spaces, which we think will accommodate all of the tenants who live here, and then some. Um, so, and, and it's based on, you know, it's based on direct experience with similar populations. I know we, we queried one building that Tom owns I think it was 101 units of housing, this, this kind of housing, and 34 tenants had cars. So it was well less, less than, it was a third of the people who had cars. And that's pretty consistent with our experience as well. Um, it's partly why we pushed hard to find a centralized location where it's walking and bike friendly, because we know that a lot of these folks cannot afford cars, so. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, you know, we, we also need parking first for staff that are coming, um, but they'll primarily be daytime users. And so there will be a natural ebb and flow between tenants who are going out with cars to work during the day and staff that might be coming on site during the day. Um, we did provide a pro parking study in the zoning application that gives, it digs a little bit deeper into the question of how, what's the right amount of parking. Um, and we actually think this parking is probably more, it's gonna be sitting some empty spaces. So it's why some of it's grasscrete instead of pavement because it's still permanent parking, but it minimizes the amount of blacktop that you have on the site. Uh, and if half the spaces are empty, it's just no one wants to look at a huge empty parking lot, so. Thank you, and, and also I just wanna echo the praise that has been heaped on this project. It's, it just looks awesome, I'm super excited for it to progress and reach the next phase. So thank you for all the work you've done. Great, thank you. 
Nate, do we have any visitors who wanted to Yeah, it looks like make there's someone um, Galaxy A10. I will, um, you can unmute yourself and you're audible. And identify yourself, please. You have to unmute. Um, yeah, I, I thought I had clicked the unmute button, but it didn't uh, follow through. It's Kathleen Anderson calling. And I, my question is about students and is this property intending to include students? Right, so um, no, <laughs> this is intended for uh, adults. Um, not undergraduate age students. So, um, and it, with the funding source that we're, one of the funding sources we're using, we're not allowed to accept full-time undergraduate students. Um, there are some exceptions for people who are older, who might be taking a course or someone who might be going back to school. Um, but the, the idea is to not use public subsidy to support people who are low income because their students and their parents are already supporting them. Um, so in the project eligibility letter, I believe we, we put in more a longer definition of what it means to be a student who would be screened out versus a student who could live in a place like this. And who are the students who could live in a place like that? So examples are someone who is working and taking a vocational class at night, for example. Uh-huh. Okay. And then, um, so I'm, I'm looking at the rents, projected rents. Yep. And I'm wondering who are the people you imagine will be able to afford those rents? Right. So in the 30% um, tier, uh, pe those people will have a, a subsidy that comes with the unit. So whatever their uh, income is, they'll pay th approximately 30% of it toward rent. So they could have a wide range of incomes, but we'd need to stay below that, whatever, 17,000 some odd no dollars. So those folks may be working. Um, they may be working part-time or full-time. They may be disabled. They may be retired we see a, a pretty wide range. Um, also at the 50% level, we see people who are working minimum wage jobs. Um, we see people who are working at the kind of lower end of the professional scale. We see people who are retired um, and we see people who are disabled. So it's a pretty broad spectrum of folks that tend to fit into those income categories. Um, because it's so close to Amherst College, we're hoping it can serve as workforce housing for the college so that, you know, adjunct faculty or someone working in dining services or land, you know, grounds crew might find it really desirable to be so close, you know, quick walking distance to their employer. Uh -huh. okay, and that's Amherst College's... And, and I was just... Well, um, so this is not Amherst College property, although it's adjacent to Amherst College. And I'm not sure that uh, community that community members from the town of Amherst can use Amherst College facilities. I mean, like the gym, for instance. I heard that in part of the conversation tonight. No, not without permission from the college, they couldn't. Yeah. But the field itself, which is directly adjacent to this building, has been discussed a lot because there seems to be a long-standing policy by the college of allowing public access to the field. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. Thanks, Thank Kathy. Thank you. Um, we'll take a couple of other brief comments. I see that we have Kate Trost and Janet Keller waiting. So I'll allow comments or questions from them, and then we're going to move on. All right, Kate, um, you can unmute yourself, and you'll be all set to speak. Hi. Hi, Kate. And Kathleen, do you remember me? Kathleen Anderson, is she gone? Oh, well. No, I'm still here. I just, it takes a minute to get the mute button pushed. I'll, I'll, no, be, in, takes... I'll be in touch with you separately. I helped you one time okay. with jewelry sales. Um, yeah, I know who you are. Hey, so one question I have is, what percentage of people will come from 
the Amherst population, that's, and first that, but then secondary, our small, our, our smaller region of Hadley, Leverett, Pelham, and Chutesbury. Mm -hmm. So the town, it's up to the town if it wants to take affirmative steps to have a local preference. Um, that would happen at the point of our conversations with the ZBA. They could make it a condition of the permit, but then the town would have to seek approval from the state to have a local preference. Um, towns can have local preference for up to 70% of the units. Um, local preference is very strictly defined and we don't get to define it. It's people who live in town, work in town, work for town government, or have kids in the school system. So it doesn't really, it's pretty much Amherst. Um, and that local preference would apply to the lottery. So it's the, the folks who would have the leg up to get in um, would, have, would have an advantage basically in getting into the initial occupancy of the property and being higher up on that initial wait list. Thank you for that. I'm a neighbor. And so you, you all might, must understand that th that matters. I would love to see people from our community that need this kind of housing have a first choice for that and or people from Hadley that are nearby, Leverett that are nearby, etc. The other question I have is could you please in your next presentation provide a three-dimensional um, of the smoking bench because as a neighbor I am a bit concerned about having to see people hanging around smoking and I think if you do the design properly it doesn't have to be visible to the neighborhood but I sure. want to do that okay okay I mean so, it, oh okay. just before you stop and to all of you all other folks I mean we're used to in most of the town center having prohibitions on smoking and would be preferable to have some at this prop on this property in the outside areas but at minimum screen it from the neighborhood if you can please thank you sure so um just for your information kate in the on the online um plan set there is a uh an image of the kind of pavilion that we would propose and then if you look at the site plan, you'll see that all around that is vegetation. And it really, it faces the parking lot that abuts the Conway Fieldhouse. Uh, so, so Laura, I just want you to know I'm a landscape architect. Yep. And the vegetation, if you show it from a plan view, you see a canopy of a tree that's much different than what you would see sure. at the ground level. So Absolutely. You need, you'll, you'll need an some kind of architectural element like a fence or a wall to really screen it or actually like a arborvitae hedge something like that that's the kind of thing if you really don't want to be able to have people see it okay let's okay. move on thanks I feel like we're getting yeah. into the weeds a little bit uh janet let's see uh kate i'm going to um disable your talking and lower your hand while it does take a minute um Janet, let's see, Janet, you can unmute yourself. You, sh you should be all set. And I, I just wanted to say thank you for um, the terrific explanation and um, what appears to be a very well thought out project. And um, we all know how much it's needed. And I just wanted to say thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, and the last comment we'll take from uh, Barbara Gravin -Wil Wilbur. Yeah, sorry. Um, Barbara, I'm going to allow you to speak. I, maybe you lowered your hand. Are you, you can unmute yourself if you want to just let us know if you want to speak or not. Hi, hey, Barbara, if you unmute yourself, so can I do that? Hi, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Barbara Graham Wilbur, and I am a, an abutter. Um, the question about local preference was an, uh, asked and answered. Um, I have a question about diversity and the importance of the diversity of the clientele, not only economically, but also 
diversity. Um, and then the other thing is given our current COVID-19 environment, uh, what plans do you have should this thing continue or blow up? Right. So, hi, Barbara. Um, we, we can't um, screen or discriminate, obviously, on applicants based on race. However, we do find that the demographic in our properties is more diverse than the surrounding community. Um, so it, it seems to work out that way. Um, and we are required to do affirmative marketing when we first do that lottery. And so it's trying to reach communities who might not otherwise know about a project. So we're doing a lot of outreach in different local newspapers and Spanish speaking newspapers and just trying to reach, reach everybody. So everybody has the same opportunity to apply. Um, it's interesting, the COVID-19, uh, we are starting to move people into the other project that I showed, the Sergeant House. And so it, we've made adjustments. It's a more incremental move in. There's a lot of disinfecting going on. I mean, one thing that's become really obvious to us during this crisis is the people who are most vulnerable in a shelter in place order are those who don't have any shelter. So we just felt, feel like there's just greater and greater urgency for people to have a place, even if it's a small place, a place that is their home, that they can stay in the event that there's a virus or something. Um, what property managers have been doing generally is sometimes the common areas become off limits um, during the case of something like this that's so contagious. Um, and the disinfecting gets just ramped up, you know, lobbies, common areas, touch surfaces, um, there's just a lot more disinfecting that takes place in the property. Thanks, and um, well, I had another question, it went right out of my head. Okay. You know where to find me. <laughs> There'll be other opportunities, I'm sure. Okay, let me move on to the last part of this piece, and that is discussion of uh, sending a letter from the Housing Trust uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals in support of this project. Um, I actually started to draft a letter, um, but it wasn't ready for prime time. So what I'm going to do is just tell you what the process is that I would like to see and also briefly summarize the areas that I think the letter should cover. Um, what I will do is I'll finish up my draft and distribute it to everybody. We cannot talk about it among ourselves and you cannot give me direct feedback but uh, you can give feedback to Nate and he'll be putting together the final version of the letter. So uh, let him know what your comments are or what additions you have. And the goal will be to get the letter uh, ready early next week. So comments would be due uh, by the end of the day next Tuesday. So here are the things that I think should be covered. And, Again, I received comments on that definitely right now. One is discussion of the need. Um, actually, the discussion of the need is pretty well uh, described in the application, which goes back to the housing production plan and then presents some more recent data about the need. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's essential that we also assert that there is a need and uh, uh, then going beyond that, I thought I would at least mention the fact that uh, 20 years ago, the development of affordable single family homes was held up for the butternut farm project people may be familiar with, and was held up for a long time until the obstacles were cleared out by the uh, state Supreme Judicial Court. And so we, that's kind of part of the Amherst history on affordable housing. And a comment that I have is I don't think we want to repeat it. The second area has to do with the appropriateness of the project. And again, we've seen a lot of the features of it as Laura has described it this evening. Um, I think that uh, Valley has done uh, really everything it could possibly do to create a plan that improves both the existing site and uh, presents an pleasing structure and interesting rooms. 
another area to cover is the quality of the developer. Valley has an extraordinarily good reputation in this area. They have their Northampton project, the most recent of which Laura mentioned. They've also had at least one and maybe more projects in Amherst that have existed for a long time and been affordable assets for our community. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to mention was the management plan. Uh, Laura's mentioned that they will have a, a 70 to 75% uh, services coordinator who will be on site. Um, I think she's really bent over backwards to uh, provide opportunities for people to get access to the services they need. On the other hand, um, it's also respectful of individuals. These are people's homes and neither Valley Community Development or the town of Amherst or any other government has the right to tell people in their own homes what kind of services they need to accept in order to live there. And so again, I think Valley's done a good job of saying, okay, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that people have access to services they need, but we're not gonna impose those services on them. We're gonna be respectful. And then the last issue I think we wanna mention is financing. Uh, financing can be difficult, especially in the not-for-profit world. Well, I've never developed a property. I know from reading and so forth that it's a lot different than if you're a for-profit developer. You go into this and there aren't really a lot of margins. It's not like you have a lot to give, you know, and if the Zoning Board of Appeals decides they want to take a unit or two away or add some parking or make other changes, you can really get to the point where pretty quickly the project becomes financially untenable. And I think we don't want to see that happen. I mean, people put enough work into this in trying to find public funding sources so that people with low incomes are gonna be able to live there. So those are the areas that I thought the letter should cover. Um, if there are other suggestions, this would be a good time to raise them and I'll try my best to include them. Carol? just like maybe to mention the fact that they're making it they're working making it a passive building that that it, so it's not just high-end Amherst people who should have access to the best and latest uh, you know sort of environmental stuff and this building does that to me that's definitely a plus okay anything else John, um, when you mentioned management, I heard Laura very specifically state that she made changes or they made changes in response to the community concerns. And I think that's really critical. Um, the fact that, you know, they're listening to the community and they've made some changes to make sure this works best for both who, the individuals who live there as well as the community. Okay. Thanks, Erica. Other thoughts? I, I would just, just reinforce, John, your statement about um, not imposing upon these people any more restrictions than one would normally have uh, for anyone else who's a resident, that we should respect these people as independent um, citizens of the, uh, of the town and uh, just because we're trying to create some set-asides for people who might be more vulnerable doesn't mean that we need to dictate how they should live their lives. So I, I really want to support you in making that statement. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Okay, then I'll just close this part of uh, the meeting out saying again, I hope to have a draft completed tomorrow. I'll send it around to everybody and you will have the weekend or up until close of business on Tuesday to let Nate know what comments you have so that he can uh, make put the final draft together 
to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'll also say or encourage you that if anybody individually wants to send a note to the Zoning Board of Appeal on the issues we've just outlined or anything else, I think that will definitely strengthen Valley's position before them. Just like we had an outpouring of support before town council for the Community Preservation Act funding, I think it's important for the town to show its support before the Zoning Board of Appeals as well. So I think that's the end of this conversation. And we'll move on to the next piece. Sure, thanks Laura and, um, and everyone for your questions and comments. Yeah, to John's point, when uh, trust members get his letter, you can only respond to me with comments. So don't, you know, don't respond all and send them to trust members. That becomes a conversation outside of an open meeting. So just send your comments to me. I'll put them all together Tuesday night. That'll be my, <clears throat> my, my rela relaxation on Tuesday evening. And then I'll get them to John on Wednesday. So. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Lauren. Good luck with this. Thank you. Jane, thanks. Nice meeting you. Yeah, sorry, I was a little bumpy on Zoom there at the beginning. Uh, That's all right. I was still in transit, so I had a I had an upgrade. Well. I had an upgrade uh, last week before a meeting, and it threw it all off. And there was about forty people waiting to get on. <laughs> oh wow! <Okay. laughs> I was a really popular guy that evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, I look forward to um, meeting with you all again soon. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I've lost track of time. What what time is it? It's eight oh eight. 808. Okay, not too bad. I wanted to be done with this by eight o'clock. And so we've come pretty close to that. That's great. Okay, the next piece of business has to do. Oh, I'm sorry. I did want to take a vote on this. Everybody in favor of our sending a letter of support for this project to uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, do a roll call. Please say yes. I mean, my sense is everyone's going to say yes, but we need to check that. Uh, Will? Yes. Tom? Yes. Carol? Yes. Erica? Yes. Uh, Sid? Yes. Uh, Rob? Yes. And, and I'm a yes. And I'm assuming Paul has not joined us yet? No, I, he hasn't texted me yet either. So I think he's still in the other meeting. Okay, so now we'll look, move on to the emergency rental assistance program. Um, I have good news there. Um, it looks like we're actually gonna have a program. Uh, we, uh, uh, Nate with Anthony Delaney put the project out to bid to three organizations. Now, I guess about two weeks ago, and uh, well, actually there were four, but three of them bid. Um, the bids were pretty close to each other. They are only a few thousand dollars apart. Uh, the lowest bid actually came from Wayfinders, but uh, their proposal made clear that they did not want to run the proposal, run the project the way that we expected them. Um, their plan was to run it the same way they run the state raft program in the region, which meant that they would be taking people first come first serve rather than giving preference to families. And there were a couple other differences, but that's the one that really stood out to me. So uh, there was some conversation with them in which they agreed, yeah, they didn't want to do it our way, they wanted to do it their way. And so as a consequence, um, their bid was put aside. The second lowest proposal came from Community Action of Pioneer Valley. They're based in Northampton and Greenfield. Um, they're headed by the former uh, Northampton mayor, Claire Higgins. Um, but it's an organization that I've had a little bit of contact with and I think other people have as well. Um, they're really a very strong anti-poverty agency, and they did agree to run the program the way that we asked. 
I think their bid was for $38,500 for administration. So out of the $250,000, that leaves a very substantial part then to actually provide rental assistance. So we are waiting for them to uh, sign the contract that Anthony Delaney sent into them. And then we can begin to uh, uh, have a hopefully a brief conversation about how to kick the program off, make sure that uh, within a week or two, people are notified, application materials are available both online and physically, and uh, we, we can start receiving applications and get a sense of just how vast the need is out there. So I think we're, as I said, uh, a week or two away from being able to publicly announce the program, but we definitely have an administrator. We should have a contract in place within a day or so, and then we can move ahead. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Nate? No, I think that's, uh, that's a good summary. The um, Yeah, I'll say it is, you know, it's unfortunate Wayfinders was the lowest bidder, but then they, they didn't want to quite run it the way it was designed. So they actually let the town know today they weren't, um, they kind of withdrew their, their proposal. Um, you know, we're excited to work with Community Action. I, I, John's right, I think they're pretty well equipped to do this quickly. You know, I think the, you know, the, will be a little bit of um, time needed just to get marketing and program design, you know, finalized if there's any changes to that, but then it's really just a matter of getting it advertised and then accepting applications. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, my only thought is we might have a huge response of people interested and then that, you know, it's a good and a bad thing. Then it's a matter of, you know, we won't be able to fund everyone, but at least um, we have some money out there. Um, and I will say the CPA committee is starting to meet, they're meeting tonight uh, in the, you know, as John has mentioned in the past, it may be that come the fall, there may be more CPA money that could be put into another second round of housing support. So it's something you know, we can use this first round as a, as a model if there's more funding available. I wanna skip down for a minute and mention one other thing. Again, Nate, we wanna amplify on this. Um, and this is the item 6C, CDBG CARES Act funding recommendations. Um, as you may recall, the money that we're using comes from the Community Preservation Act which does not allow uh, for funds to be used to provide support services to households that would be receiving the rental assistance. Uh, ordinarily, you'd think that would be something you'd really want to be able to do, but we'd be prevented by state statute or regulation from doing that. The good news is that the town received money under the federal CARES program that went to the Community Development Block Grant Committee to uh, determine how to allocate. And if you remember from our last meeting, we knew that there would be uh, proposals for household support for this program from both Family Outreach of Amherst and Amherst Community, uh, Amherst Community Connections. Um, I did send them a note um, pursuant to our conversation saying we would like to see both funded. But I did also say that if only one could be funded, then if they only had enough money to fund one project, it shouldn't be divided up. Um, you wanted a program to be strong enough um, to have the resources that it need to be able to follow through. Um, the Community Development Block Grant Committee met and as I understand it, they will be making the recommendation to the town manager that Amherst Family Outreach be funded at the level of $50,000 to provide this household support program. So I think it's great that uh, uh, we're going to see that happen, hopefully just around the same time that the rental assistance program gets on its feet. Uh, uh, Amherst uh, Family Outreach is already serving some of the clients who are likely to be uh, eligible, and so they don't necessarily have to wait for a new funding. 
to move ahead. Uh, so I think those are two very positive things that have happened as a consequence of our work as the housing trust. And I'm very pleased with it. I don't know, are there other comments or questions that people have? Looks like Carol has her hand raised. Hey, Carol. This is probably a really dumb question, but as a new person on a housing trust, now that this has happened and there's a contractor to do it, what is our remaining responsibility as a trust, if any, to the program that we have just launched? Um, it's a little vague, I will say this. Um, formally, the relationship between the town and the administrator is contractual. So we don't formally have a role, but informally, at least I and probably Rita and as well as obviously Nate will be talking to uh, uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley about how to implement the program. Um, they will also be following through, sending the letter to landlords who are receiving funds, asking them to match them if at all possible with contributions of their own to their individual tenants. Uh, I think also I will be expecting to get data back from Community Action Pioneer Valley about how many ac applications were received, how many were funded, so that you know, if we want to work with the Community Preservation Act Committee to expand the program, we'll have some information available that provides a basis for doing it. So I think we'll be following up. I think also, Carol, once we make an announcement, any of us um, can serve as a conduit if we hear about people who are looking for this kind of assistance uh, and funnel them into community action. So we don't have a lot of formal responsibility, but informally, I see us trying to do some follow-up and certainly a responsibility on my part to get back to you all with whatever we're learning as they implement the program. Yeah, I think Carol, the other one is, um, you know, through the good work of Rita and John, the program design was pretty well polished and the trust, you know, looked at it at over two meetings. So, you know, unless um, Community Action has a, you know, some questions that really, you know, have to do with how the program is set up, there really isn't much role for the trust that, you know, if we, for instance, if the trust just said, let's do a rental program, and then it was up to staff and the contractor to come up with, you know, how to actually implement it, then maybe we'd be going back and forth more, but the trust has already done that. So, I mean, um, during the, um, during the uh, procurement, there was a few questions about um, things that we answered. And so I, I don't anticipate many questions from community action. I think it's maybe just a matter of small little contractual details and then just moving forward with marketing and things, uh, but not any big questions about how the program should be operated or designed. And that, I mean, that's a testament to the work of the trust to get it ready. Yeah, I'll just say, I think, our job is virtually done. We can breathe a sigh of relief and think about the other projects that we want to get moving. <laughs> That's the way I look at it personally, Carol. Okay, well, th thank you. I just thank you very much for the clarity. Okay, last time um, I had noted that there were two things pending before the legislature. Um, one was a rent freeze proposal that has been offered by uh, Lindsay Sabadosa of Northampton. And uh, I think it's Paul Mark, and I can't tell you what community he represents. Um, there were also a lot of co-sponsors and we agreed that I would uh, ask uh, our state representative, Mindy Dom, and our state senator, Joe Comerford, where they stand on those and also on the expansion of the RAFT program. RAFT is rental assistance for families in transition. Um, it's similar to what we're trying to do. Um, and the state has had a traditional RAFT program. They're expanding it now so that it has a COVID-19 focus. 
um, so that it's a little bit broader. Um, it would have people up to 80% AMI as opposed to 50% and below. Um, in any event, uh, CHAP is asking the legislature to add, I believe it's $60 million to the program, either through the supplemental budget um, or in next year's budget or both. So I talked to Mindy about it and I also emailed her and emailed Joe. Um, I don't have a note back from Mindy, but in some she's in support of both of these things. Um, even if she didn't show up initially as a co-sponsor. Um, I, I did want to read the note that I got from Joe's chief of staff, Jared Friedman. It's not a very long note, but I, I think it's worth you all hearing. Um, first, he says, great news about the local emergency rental assistance program. Congratulations on getting that launched and agreed that the state must help towns meet this need. We have certainly heard uh, about the $50 million ask for RAF from CHAPA and other advocates. Joe has been leading the Senate's COVID-19 working group and the working group conveyed the $50 million RAF ask to the Senate Budget Committee, which is currently working on a $1 billion supplemental budget. Whether the entire RAF allocation goes into the supplement or whether it is funded uh, next year um, is something we just need to find out. Joe will stay on it and keep pushing for this funding. Uh, Joe also completely supports a rent increase freeze for the duration of the state emergency, uh, specifically the bill we mentioned before. Um, it could be accomplished that way or through uh, economic recovery packages that the legislature may also take up. We will also look for any further housing legislation that may be taken up soon. But if an economic development bill moves first, that could also be a vehicle worth using to pursue the issue. Um, so basically, I won't read the rest of the note, but um, it's clearly very supportive of what we've done and indicates that, as I said, Mindy does, Joe also supports both the rent freeze and the RAF program. Um, and I actually got a brief note after Jared sent me his note from Joe, basically thanking Jared for representing her position and getting back to me first. So I think that's all good news. Uh, beyond that, I don't think I have anything else to add about legislative updates. I don't know, are there any questions or further comments? Okay, then we're moving through the, uh, the rest of our agenda pretty quickly, um, which is good because <laughs> I can see a few people yawning. <laughs> uh, let's see, um, updates. Nate, do you wanna tell us about where you think we'll be with respect for consultants for wetlands at East Street and Strong Street and other similar kind of property analysis contracts? I think I'm just gonna delete this from the next agenda so that way maybe members can forget. <laughs> no, the, um, we, uh, there's a new planner, Ben Bregger. He, he actually helped the trust, um, but probably, maybe it was over a year ago now. And um, he's helping me. We have, um, we're getting us, we have a pretty much a scope of work together for some wetlands. So we're trying to um, work with Anthony Delaney to get that procured and um, John and I spoke today, the town buildings will um, maybe be opening up in late July. So then, um, you know, I've been talking to uh, the, the um, asbestos um, contractor for East Street School, but we, you know, we, um, we'd have to get someone in there. The town wanted to have a few buildings looked at. So at one point we thought bundling um, hazardous material uh, assessments together to get a better kind of economies of scale there. But um, the wetlands piece is something that we've worked on. So we're getting a, a draft scope. And um, so we know we'd have to, uh, depending on the amount, have to seek three quotes or we're trying to keep it under one, under 10,000 and then we can just go with one consultant. So um, 
pre-COVID, I'd asked for some quotes from a few people and I need to follow back up. I had reached out to a few consultants to get an estimate and, um, but I, I, that's something we're working on. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah. Hopefully by our next meeting, maybe we'll have something more that we can talk about um, in both of those areas. Uh, because they are critical to bar, bar be able to move along to um, other projects. Right. Um, another very brief update, uh, 40R consultant work. The 40R is a proposal to create an overlay district in downtown Amherst. Um, we've had, the town had consultants that were actually hired as a consequence of a grant that Nate, Rita, and I wrote um, that came to the town to do some development work around this. And they actually produced a draft 40R bylaw and have made a number of presentations, some all town presentations, and most recently a presentation to the planning board. All that's kind of up in the air. Um, the planning board and the planning department are both receiving uh, comments on their latest work. And uh, we're supposed to meet with uh, consultants next week to talk about what the next steps are. Uh, not surprisingly, what they proposed is controversial. There are people who think it's a good idea and people are very, other people who are very concerned about um, increasing density downtown. Nate, do you have anything you want to add to that or does anybody have any questions? No, I think, you know, um, we'll share it with the trust. You know, the goal of the, um, the grant was, um, you know, technical assistance for a consultant to develop what would be a district boundary and a bylaw and design guidelines that are complete enough that they could be adopted by a town. So, you know, essentially it's more than just a study. They were actually, the consultants will, will provide the town with, you know, zoning language and boundary, um, uh, you know, some justification for boundaries. And so that can be shared with the trust. I think, you know, once the consultants finish their work, it's something that the trust and the planning board can meet uh, together with to discuss, uh, you know, 40 R, um, you know, it has a requirement of affordable housing. It has design guidelines. And there's probably a few ways to achieve it. Um, if, if um, you know, if the planning board, if people are hesitant for 40R, there's different zoning mechanisms. But I think it's something that, um, you know, I think, I think it would be important for the trust to keep discussing it because, you know, without changing the zoning um, in town, you know, we still can have development that won't provide any affordable units and may not have the design or architecture that uh, people like. And, you know, 40R may, I, I agree that I think there's concerns and there's rightly so, um, it is one tool that could be used, but I think it's something that the trust could look at and consider, you know, if the trust wants to support it um, in what shape or form, and then I maybe having a joint meeting with the planning board in the future just to discuss, to discuss it a little bit. Um, I mean, that's it, you know, I, you know, once we send everything out, it is complicated. The consultants are going to make one more presentation, um, I think to the planning board and, you know, we can invite the trust to that and you can listen. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, so of being uh, able to hear about it together. So I let, please let us know when it is going to the planning board. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Okay, upcoming events. There was only one listed on the agenda, but actually I have five. <laughs> so I'll just briefly go over those. Uh, sorry for not getting on there earlier. Next Tuesday evening at 6.30, that's June 16th, there will be a meeting of the Amherst Housing Coalition which would have a somewhat similar agenda to the one that we had this evening. Um, then uh, the following week on Tuesday, there will be a regional meeting of CHAPA, the Citizens Housing and Planning Association. This is basically for people in Western Mass 
Um, it'll be on Tuesday, June 23rd at 2 p.m. And I will send a reg registration link out to people. Um, like everything else, it will be a Zoom meeting. Um, there, uh, I was talking to Dana LeWinter earlier today, and there are something like 90 people who have already registered for it. So it promises to be a, a pretty lively meeting. Some of it will be presentation and discussion, but Dana also plans to have people break out into uh, groups of six or seven to discuss what's going on locally and what the implications are for affordable housing and also for racial justice. Uh, so that's the number two on my list. Uh, the ZBA hearing is there. It will be on June 25th um, in the evening. And again, we'll be able to link to it and listen in on the hearing. Um, it would be great if not only we have the housing trust letter, but lots of other individual letters to the Zoning Board of Appeals in support of the project at 132 Northampton Road. So again, I urge you to do that. Um, hopefully, when you see my letter, you'll get inspired or you'll so be disgusted that you think a better letter is needed and do one yourself. Uh, the next housing trust meeting will be on Thursday, July 9th. So that's just about a month away. So put that into your calendars. Uh, and while we're talking about a July meeting, I was recalling that last year, our August meeting was pretty poorly attended. I can't remember what the numbers were, but it, we, we definitely didn't have a quorum. And so uh, unless there's some really pressing business, I was thinking about our not having an August meeting this year. Uh, but I do think we want to have the July meeting. So are there any comments or questions about an August meeting? Well, I'm wondering if it was because everyone was on vacation, no one's really going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you could be right, Erica. Uh, or, or if you're on vacation, you can just zoom on in. <laughs> that's true. You can zoom in from vacation. That'd be fantastic. You don't need to be home. Well, um, again, I, I'm willing to do an August meet, meeting. I'm certainly not going on vacation, or at least I have no plan to do that right now. Uh, any other thoughts about that? Skip it, except unless in July, it turns out that it seems like we should do something in August. Right. So we can wait a month to make a decision, Carol. That's true. OK. Um, any other comments or thoughts that people want to share before we close out the meeting? I just had a question about the letter to the zoning board. Um, some of us actually submitted letters to DHCD, uh, I believe. Uh, is that a similar letter or you want it to be something different? Um, I, um, I don't know the answer to that, Erica. Um, really, it should, it probably does, but it should address issues that are related to the application for a Comprehensive. So specific, okay, so specific to the application. Yeah, um, I mean, you can say you support the project in general, um, but <clears throat> I don't know, and they can tell us whether the uh, file of letters that went to DHCD or the earlier ones for to town council will all be available to the zoning board, um, but they may pour, pay more attention anyway to uh, letters that are written specifically to them. I think the, um, Erica, everything that was sent previously was for the project eligibility phase. Right. And that's, that's online and it's been um, sent to the ZBA, but if you wanted to write so something again, it could be similar. I, you know, I can't say what exactly your letter said. Um, and that, that could work. I think just, you know, this time it's for the application uh, phase. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping the ZBA members read everything that was submitted uh, previously, just so they have an understanding of it. You know, there was a lot of letters, um, but I, you know, it wouldn't, it would, it would help to have another letter perhaps. I'm not, you know. 
Well, I think, you know, I think you answered my question. Um, certainly tweaking it in terms of some of the comments tonight in terms of how they have actually responded to concerns in the community and some of the, you know, the additional information that they provided this evening, so. Mm -hmm. Right, and I'm looking at the CHAPA website, just so you know, the June 23rd meeting, it's, you know, CHAPA does the regional meetings, um, and this one's for Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden counties, and, um, yeah, John, I, I, I can send a link if you can. It, it was hard to find, interestingly enough. It's not on their calendar of events. It's somehow it's buried in their, maybe like their workshop series or something, but not on their calendar. I got an email from Dana, so I can send that out. Okay, that, yeah, all right. Um, anything else people are looking for, would like to know? Okay, well, I thank you all for participating. I won't take a roll call vote on adjournment. Just ask if everybody's in favor of adjourning our meeting. John, there's still some members of the public. I don't know if you just want to ask if they want to raise their hands or not. Oh, okay, yeah. Is there, yeah, I looked for a minute ago and there wasn't anybody who had raised their hands, but yeah, if there anybody interested in making a public comment at this point, the floor is open. Thank you, Nate. Yep. If anyone's interested, just raise your hand. If not, we'll just, I guess the meeting can end in a minute. All right, I'm not seeing any hands, John. Okay, again, thanks everybody. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Have a good evening and we'll be in touch about our next meeting. And thanks, you know, based on what happened with the uh, emergency rental assistance program. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.